Well, hey, it is great to be here with you today, and it's a great weekend just to kind of rethink of like, why do we do what we do? Who are we as a church? What is the mission to which God has called us? Because this has been one crazy year. And for me, this is the first time in over a month to actually be able to preach through a sermon. So it is a thrill for me to be able to get to do this with us. And yet, as we look at our passage... We just had it read. The passage is John 21, 15 through 22. These eight verses might, at a first glance, cause you to scratch your head a little bit and say, what? Why did Jesus do that? Um, Seems a little harsh. Uh, Seems a little heavy in your face. Uh, Jesus, what are you doing to this dude named Simon Peter? Because here's how it plays out. They just finished breakfast, and Jesus gets Peter's attention and says, do you love me more than these? And Simon Peter responds with, yes, Lord, you you know that I love you. Jesus comes right back with, hey, Simon, do you love me? And Simon Peter responds with, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then a third time, it's like, come on, Jesus, give the guy a break. He hits him with, Simon, do you love me? And Simon Peter responds with, Lord, you you know everything. You you know that I love you. It's like, huh. So what's going on? Like you you might read these eight verses, especially if you did one of those holy flips. Have you ever done one of those? Like, God, what do you want me to read today? And you just grab these eight verses kind of like out of context. You might read it and go, huh. Huh. Jesus must be the one having a bad day. It feels harsh. It feels mean. I mean like, it, it, there's other people around. Is Jesus making fun of him? And you would misread the fact that this is arguably the greatest restoration story in all of the Bible. A message of hope. A message of forgiveness. A message of purpose. That in a time like this, in a year like this, there are a whole bunch of us who desperately need to hear a hope-filled message. But for us to get it, we have to know the backstory. That's going to take a few minutes, but it's worth it because this story takes on all new meaning. So here is the backstory. In Jesus' public ministry, actually really early on, he began to call people to be his disciples. just means a follower. And he would literally use the phrase, come follow me. Luke actually tells the story in his gospel. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. In Luke's gospel, chapter 5, he tells the account of when Jesus said to Peter, come on. Here's what was going on. Peter had been out fishing all night. Hadn't caught a thing. But as day broke, Jesus needed a a pulpit, a a platform, a a stand. And so he said to Peter, hey, can I borrow your boat so I can stand in it? You put out just a little bit in the water, and I'm going to preach to all these people. Peter must have been thinking, I ain't catching any fish, so I might as well help a dude out. And so Jesus gets in the boat. Peter pushes back a little bit. Jesus preaches his sermon. When the sermon is over, Jesus turns to Simon Peter and says, Hey, Pete, cast your net like out in the deep water and you'll have a great catch. Peter had to be thinking, Dude, I'm the fisherman, you're the preacher, you stick to what you do, I'll stick to what I do. I didn't catch anything all night. But if you tell me to do that, I'll do it. I'll do it. So here we go. Peter cast his net out in the, in the deep as Jesus instructed him. And there were so many fish in his net, it started to break. And so he had to call his fishing buddies over, his partners, Peter, James, and some other dudes brought their boat over. And by the time they hauled in all of the fish, both boats were beginning to sink. And Jesus says to Peter, James, and John, Hey, don't worry, don't worry, because from here on out, you're not going to be catching fish. You're going to be fishers of men. 
And from day one, Peter was one of those followers of Jesus who was really confident. Have you ever met a confident follower of Jesus? Like Peter thought he had it going on. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, hey, there are other people leaving. You guys going to leave? And Peter said, where else will we go? You have the words of life. Like he was confident. Then on another occasion, Jesus said, who do you guys say that I am? Like who am I to you? And Peter said, you, you are the Christ, the son of God. That was actually the day that Jesus named Simon Peter. On this rock, I'll build my church. And then things got heated. At the very end, on the same night that Jesus would be betrayed and arrested, he's talking to them about what is about to happen. And he says, guys, when they strike the shepherd, the sheep are going to scatter. You guys are going to leave me. And Simon says, I don't know about these other characters but I will follow you. I will never leave you. I'll go to death with you. And Jesus said, well, before the night's over, like before the rooster crows in the morning, you will have betrayed me three times. Which is exactly what happened. Judas did betray Jesus. When they were in the garden, the guard from the high priest showed up. They arrested him. Peter actually took a swing at a guy, cut his ear off, and Jesus had to put it back on. But as bold as he seemed in the moment, he then cowered. Peter and John followed Jesus to where the high priest was, where they were putting him on trial. It was quite a spectacle of hate, vengeance. And Peter was waiting outside. And a young servant girl said to him, you're not one of those Jesus followers, are you? And Peter said, no, I am not. A little bit later, he was in the courtyard. There was a little fire, a charcoal fire that had been lit. And it was, just, it was a chilly night, and they were all warming themselves around it. And a couple of the guys said, hey, you're not one of those Jesus followers, are you? Peter said, no, I am not. And then finally, one of the servants of the high priest who had been in the garden when Jesus was arrested said, wait a minute, you are a Jesus follower. I remember you in the garden. Actually, you whacked my cousin's ear off. And he says, no, no, I am not a follower of Jesus. And the rooster crowed. Which brings us back to John 21. Here's the setup. They put Jesus on the cross. Peter's friend, his mentor, the guy he committed his life to, the guy he had hopes that he would be the Messiah and things would be different, is now dead. And in the midst of all of that chaos, Peter knows full well he went from being Peter the Apostle to being Peter the Apostate, the traitor. He, he was no friend at all. When his friend needed a friend, he went AWOL. And then Sunday morning, the, the tomb's empty. And there are beginning to be stories told of Jesus appearing to the women and then to others. When we get into John chapter one, 21, excuse me, verse 14 says that we're reading the third appearance of Jesus to others. And yet, John's just telling us this is the third he's told us. The beautiful thing about the way John writes is he doesn't tell things in chronological orders. He's making a theological case for the resurrected Jesus. So we don't know what order they are in from John's gospel. This is just the third one he's told us about. What well, happened early in the morning, if you've ever been up when the sun rises, you know there's that time before the sun actually rises, that it begins to be a little bit light. You can begin to see 
people in a distance, but you can't really see who they are. And so the guys had been out fishing. Peter had said, hey, I'm going to go fishing. Who'd blame him? Guys got to eat. So somewhere in the dark, they had begun to fish, but they hadn't caught anything. Oh, that sounds familiar. But as dawn was beginning to break, they were about 100 yards offshore, and this darkened figure off out there in the distance says, put your net on the right side. Now imagine if you've been fishing, you're just in a, a little boat, and your net's been on the left side, and this dude on the shore says, cast it on the right side. It's not like he said, hey, I know where the fishing hole is, or hey, you need to be at a different lake. He says, cast it on the other side. And you know the fishermen have to be thinking, whatever. But they did it. They cast the net on the right side. And when they did, there was this huge catch of fish. And John leans over to Peter and says, that's now, it's not that the sun had come up. It's not that John had better eyesight than Peter did. It's undoubtedly that John remembered. He remembered the day when Jesus said, come on, follow me. You will be fishers of men because their boats were about to sink. There were so many fish. This is the one who had control of all creation. Impetuous Peter jumps into the water and goes swimming for Jesus. Leaving the rest of the disciples to drag the fish and the boats to shore. And that's where they had breakfast together. And now you're ready to hear the words of Jesus. In the most beautiful restoration story, arguably in all of the Bible. So start with me. In verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? That phrase jumps out to me. Because remember, Peter had told Jesus, hey, all these other scallywags, all these other losers, I can't vouch for them, but let me tell you what, I will go with you to the end. Hey, Pete. You better than these guys? That have to be hard to hear. Really hard to hear. And then at the end he says, feed my lambs. Peter had been following Jesus. Peter had told him, you will be fishers of men. Jesus had been discipling Peter to proclaim the gospel, to lead people, to tell people where they can find life. And so when Jesus says, feed my lambs, do you know what the message is? I love you. I want you. You're on the team. I'm not done with you. I forgive you. All that is packaged in. Feed my lambs. It's arguably the most beautiful restoration story. It's the beauty of the gospel. God welcoming us just as we are. Verse 16. Then we get it a second time. Jesus said, Simon, do you love me? This time there's no, do you love me more than these? Like this is the time it's like, do you love me for real? Are, are you a fan of me? Do you like me? Are you good with me? Or do you love me, Peter? Like, do you love me? unconditionally commitment are you with me do you really love me peter and peter responds with that yes lord you know that i love you and this time jesus says tend my lambs tend my sheep care for my people not just feed them not just tell them, not just preach the good news. Take care of my people. And what do you know about taking care of people? Sometimes it's messy. 
Sometimes they fail you. Sometimes they promise they'll be there and then they don't show up. Sometimes they promise they'll never do that again and then they fall right back into it. Hey, Pete, you, you know this personally. People mess up. I, I welcome you back. I want you on the team. I want you to care for my people in such a way that you know they're going to let you down. It's part of caring for sheep. Then the third time, verse 17, John even tells us, like Peter's grieved that Jesus says this the third time. I mean, he's, he's got to be getting a little embarrassed as the other disciples, uh, disciples excuse me, are listening in. He's, he's, he's got to be getting just a little bit embarrassed, a little bit frustrated, a little bit grieved. It's a little bit, it, face is red, a little bit embarrassed, a little bit like, oh. But Jesus wasn't just going to brush over it. Has anyone ever said to you, I'm sorry? And you said, it's okay. That's actually a really bad response. Now, it's acceptable for you to say, hey, we're okay. But it's a really bad thing if somebody confesses a sin to you for you to say, oh, it's okay. No, it wasn't. That's why they're confessing a sin. The right response is for us to say, I accept your apology. I forgive you. We're okay. Jesus refused to gloss over it. Jesus refused to say, hey, Pete, it's no big deal. He brought it back up that third time. He required Peter to live through it again. Just as you denied me three times, I'm going to ask you three times, do you love me? And this time Peter responds with, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. You can sense the heaviness. You can sense him declare who he knows Jesus to be. Not just, oh, you know I love you. Oh, you know I love you, man. No, this is a, Jesus, you know everything. Like, you know what I did to you. You know how I was ashamed of you. You know how that little servant girl asked me, and I wouldn't even admit I was there. I wouldn't even admit I knew you. I even called a curse down upon myself and said, strike me dead, oh God, if I am a follower of Jesus. You know everything. It's, it's the beauty of the gospel. God knows everything. And he still wants us. That's the prayer we pray when we experience the gospel, when we experience salvation of saying, God, you know I am a sinner. You know what I've done. You know everything. And I believe you still want me. I believe you sent Jesus to die in my place. The gospel of Jesus restores us into relationship with God. It's the story of God becoming one of us to save us. It's the story of the father who ran to the prodigal son. As Andre mentioned this week in our study, it's, it's the beautiful message of 2 Corinthians 7. That grief, godly grief, brings salvation from repentance, no regret. That's the gospel. And Peter senses this, you know everything. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Take care of them. Feed my lambs. Which then takes us to verse 18. Jesus says to Peter, truly, truly, I, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted to go. When you were young, now, don't think baby, infant, child, toddler. He's, he's talking about Peter following him. He's, he's, he's not talking back in the day. He's not talking about back when he was in high school. In this context, he's talking about Peter following him. That's what this whole conversation is about. 
And he says to Peter, when you were young, like when we started, when I said, hey, I'm going to make you a fisherman, the reality is you were strong and you were vibrant. You dressed yourself and the reality is you went wherever you wanted to go. Like you said you were following me, but really what it was about is what I could do for you. Because you'd been watching me. You'd been listening to me teach. And you had hopes that I would be the one you wanted me to be. That I would bring the deliverance for Israel that you wanted. That I would change your life the way you wanted your life changed. In reality, that's, that's not so different from where we all start. When you began to be a follower of Jesus, so if you would say, hey, I'm a Christian, it started with you going where you wanted to go. It started with you saying, hey, I have a problem. I think God can fix it through Jesus. Hey, I don't want to go to hell. I believe in Jesus. Or hey, I have some brokenness, and I think Jesus will make my life better. So you went where you wanted to go. But then Jesus says to Peter, but, but there's coming more. When you get old, when you are mature, when you grow in your following of me, others will dress you and they will lead you where you do not want to go. There's coming a day that you will surrender. And when Jesus said that, Peter had to be connecting the dots of, oh, wow. Like Jesus allowed them to lead him to the cross. Like Jesus allowed them to arrest him. Like I got the sword out. Like I was ready to fight. And Jesus said, put your sword away. And he allowed them to take him. And now he's alive. Jesus inviting Peter to see something more that was going on. And he says to Peter, in the future, your following of me will look very different. Very different. It won't be about where you want to go. You will be living a life surrendered to something so, so much more. If you listen to some people talk about following Jesus you listen to some people who preach sermons about Jesus. What it sounds like is, hey, follow Jesus and he'll give you a better life. Follow Jesus and he'll give you the things you want. Like if you'll just believe, if you'll just pray, if, if you'll just do a few things, like do it the Jesus way, then he will give you what you want in life. But Jesus is indicating to Peter that that's how you first followed me. But that's, that's not old, mature, developed following. Now, John gives us a note and says, hey, this is Jesus telling us how Peter's going to die. It's not recorded in Scripture, but in church history, in church tradition. Peter was martyred like they killed him because he would not shut up about this Jesus guy. So they got ready to execute him by crucifixion, and Peter says, hey, I'm not worthy to die like Jesus did. Flip me upside down when you string me up. Something happened in Peter. And we begin to see the evidence of a changed Peter, an older Peter, a different Peter, when you turn just one more page to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, Peter gathers with the disciples, and he says, man, we got to replace Judas according to Scripture Acts chapter 2, he stood in front of the crowds. Now remember, he went out in front of one servant girl, two guys, and then another group. And he says, you guys killed the Messiah. And then in Acts chapter 4, when he got arrested for preaching of the resurrected Jesus, he said, do to me what you got to do to me. I will not stop preaching what I've seen and heard, and that is the resurrected Jesus. Peter begins to show that his following of Jesus is changing. He's getting old. He's growing in his following in such a way it is different. So what is Jesus' invitation to Jesus? 
excuse me, what is Jesus' invitation to Peter? First, follow me. Follow me. Which is a message of, I want you. And there are many of us that in a crazy year like 2020, we need to hear that message from God. Him saying, I want you, follow me. I've given Jesus for you, come follow me. And in your following of me, there is purpose. In your following of me, there's an opportunity to help others follow me. Feed my sheep, take care of my lambs. And in that, your following of me will go from young, when it was really about what you want, to old, discovering the beauty, the best of following me wherever I lead you. Which brings me to my debacle. So five weeks ago, I took a fall. And the question is, like, how do we fall or fail forward? I don't remember a thing that happened in my accident. Um, Somehow I I was up on a ladder and, and I was taking these boards off of a barn on the ceiling. And I had a big pry bar thing. And this is the evidence that the board I was prying on broke, had a couple knots in it, and I went flying. I I don't remember flying. That'd be kind of a cool memory to have. I don't remember getting knocked out cold. I don't remember sometime after being unconscious going into the house and saying to Carol Ann, I think I fell. Blood all over my face, three broken bones in my face, three broken ribs, two broken wrists. I was a mess. I don't remember any of the 20 times that I said to Carol Ann, what is today and what happened to me? I can tell you I made a mess. I made a mess of my body. I made a mess of kind of our family's life. And I remember feeling this tall. I remember feeling like such an idiot. I remember that little voice in my ear of, Michael, you are an idiot. Because accidents happen, boards break. But I wasn't being cautious. I wasn't taking the necessary steps to be safe. I was up a little too high on the ladder And I was reaching too far, and I'd forgotten I was 48, not 18. Like back when I was 18, I think I could have done a double flip and landed on my feet. But not a 48. I'm a little wobbly now. And I just remember feeling like, Michael, you are so stupid. Do you know what you've done to your wife? Like She's a mess. 20 times when you tell your spouse, what is today? What happened to me? It's a little freaky. Michael, do you realize what you did to your mom? Five years ago, your dad fell to his death. What's she thinking right now? And this little project you have going on at home, you kind of screwed that up, right? And your church, I mean, how irresponsible. And then, day after day, I kept experiencing grace. My wife of 27 years, And I'm telling you what, I'm so thankful that what we have is not just puppy love. I'm so thankful that it wasn't just that fallen in love phase. You know the time when you meet somebody and you're like, man, we hit it off. Like, I think we could be friends. Or you meet somebody and you're like, wow, I think we could have a romantic relationship. Wow, he likes the same stuff I do. We had such a great conversation. You're like, woo, this might be good. But if it goes no further than that, we're just always chasing the high. So thankful. Because my wife had to serve me in ways that are kind of really embarrassing. I'll let your mind go. 
to how I had to be served in those days. I'm so thankful for all the ways you loved me. My mom loved me. I experienced grace. And you know, my 2020 is, is not that much different than almost all of our 2020s. Like, we've been in such a place of brokenness. Just this past week, we sat in this room, socially distanced, almost our entire staff in this big, big circle. And we started talking. And like we were all crying. Like we're just boo-hooing. This has not been an easy year. This has not been a fun year. One mom said, tears running down her face. The stands are empty. I'm not getting to watch my kids be out on the field and enjoy those, those big events that our community comes together and enjoy sports and performances. Another wife said, I don't think we're going to be able to buy a house now. A dad and father said, I don't feel like I can be a good dad and father because like everything's out of control. Another mom shared from a biracial family, just the tension in our country is, is hard for my family. This has been a really difficult year. And when we have failure, we, we have those sayings in our culture of, if you fail, try, try again. Learn your lesson. Get back on the horse. Try it again. You know, it's like, is, is that it? I mean, there's, there's some truth to don't give up. Is that it? And the message of the gospel is, follow me. God's saying, I have provided for your salvation. I want you just as you are. I know everything you did. And I've proven that I want you. His name's Jesus. Feed my sheep. Man, we've had some, some desires crushed this year. I thought we were going to be able to do this. I thought we would have this. I thought we would be up on plane this year. And God is saying, take care of my sheep. Find the joy in life of helping other people follow Jesus. If you've taken a few steps, quit worrying about, hey, God, are you giving me more? Are you giving me more? Are you blessing me more? And help people come with you. And then, think young to old. Don't stay stuck in that young love of Jesus. Oh, I felt the weight of my sins lifted. Oh. I prayed and he answered it. Oh, it was great. Jesus, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? It's going to be awesome. What are you going to do next? Oh, he didn't do anything today. Does he even love me? Man, Peter would be front in line saying, I still remember the day I started following Jesus. And that was a beautiful thing. But love is to grow in maturity. To the place where we're not chasing that next adrenaline proof from God that he loves us and instead discovering the joy of surrender. Young to old. That's what God is inviting us into. During a year we all want to make sense of it. God says, come follow me. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for the joy of being gathered together in a year that's different. Our gatherings look different. Our rooms are more empty. Our distance is more distanced. And it still feels weird. We still have lots of questions. We still wonder what you're going to do. And in that wondering of what you will do, we 
have the joy of remembering what you have done. And so God, I ask that in the midst of chaos, in the midst of failures, in the midst of disappointments, in the midst of crushed dreams, in the midst of us wondering where are you and how can a good God allow all this stuff to happen, we would again see your goodness represented by a cross. The beauty of the gospel message, you providing our salvation through Jesus. God, remind us of what it looks like to experience salvation. Remind us, oh God, of what it looks like to grow in our relationship with you. Remind us, oh God, what it really means to say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. Thank you, oh God, for what you're doing. We ask this to your glory and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.